This is the secret world of Whitehall. It's dominated by three great offices of state that deal with money, power, and crime. In this three-part series, I'm talking to ministers past and present and to normally camera-shy Whitehall mandarins and telling the story of the great offices from the inside. Tonight, the Foreign Office. Many behind-the-scenes battles have been fought here, battles against prime ministers and between Foreign Office mandarins and ministers. The Foreign Office regards the arrival of each new minister like an oyster regards the arrival of a grain of sand, the intrusion of an irritant with a very low statistical probability of ever producing a pearl. Mrs. Thatcher, no, she didn't like Foreign Office at all. Famously, she said, we have a Department of Agriculture to look after farmers, we have Department of Defense to look after the soldiers, and we've got the Foreign Office to look after the foreigners. The Foreign Office is the grandest of the three great offices and has long been a palace of dreams. It was built at the height of our Victorian imperial power specifically to impress foreigners. Its grand staircase offers a daunting introduction to the place for every new foreign secretary. It's quite intimidating. I said on my first week here I had to pinch myself when I go into my office and at some level you still feel that. What's interesting about other diplomats, kings, presidents who come here, is that they're obviously struck by the grandeur of it, but they really like it. They really like it. They come into my room and they say, I've been here before in 1984 under Geoffrey Howe and I'm really pleased to come back. So there's a sense that they're having to perform on the big stage. This is the Foreign Secretary's room from where the Liberal Sir Edward Grey looked out on the eve of the First World War. And when you stand and you look out of the window where Gray said the lanterns are going out all over Europe and they may not be lit again in my lifetime, you have a very, very strong sense that this is a country that has helped shape history. Many of the problems in the world started or had real links to this building. Yesterday I met the president of Afghanistan, the Durand Line, 2,600 kilometers between Afghanistan and Pakistan, was drawn by a man from this building it's still not agreed. The uh, countries named on that dome from the League of Nations didn't work. Uh, the Locarno rooms over there that were uh, so-called after the treaties of Locarno in 1925, they were meant to foster amity and peace between nations of Europe in the interwar period, terrible failure. So you have a sense of humility in this building as well as a sense of grandeur, and I think that's probably quite important. The Victorian Lord Palmerston, who served for 15 years as Foreign Secretary, had the Foreign Office built in the style of a Renaissance palace to proclaim Britain's status in the world. And today, even though we've lost an empire, the Foreign Office sees itself as the institution that allows Britain to punch above its weight on the international stage. It has a network of over 250 embassies and consulates, and Britain is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, with a seat at the top table of the European Union, the G8, and NATO. And we have the military and intelligence muscle to back our diplomacy. As the self-proclaimed standard bearer of Whitehall, the Foreign Office has always prided itself on recruiting the brightest and best. Inside, with conscious echoes of Imperial Rome, the faces on the statues of the men in togas aren't Romans, but Victorian men from the ministry. You were cleared, it was an elite service, uh, and it had a different examination, um, and the people were grand. It was awesome. Um, the actual building, uh, which was then dark and, and, and rather dirty and very post-war. We're talking about 1952, but it was awesome. Well, I think I was rather terrified of the Foreign Office when I first went there. Anyone above the age of about 40 
was still wearing a bowler hat every day, was wearing a black jacket and pinstripe trousers. Uh, and even at my uh, insignificant level, we were expected to wear stiff collars, stiff white collars to be laundered every day sort of thing. And the old system of the Foreign Office still prevailed. The most junior officers, desk officers, sat there in groups of three or four in front of coal fires, which were topped up by messengers every hour or two. The Foreign Office was very masculine, extremely few women. We had an awful lot of sporting metaphors when I joined the Foreign Office. We kept straight bats on sticky wickets against pretty fast bowling, uh, and we went home at close of play. Foreign Office people always had a special something, and they were almost the last generation for whom the word duty could be used without people smirking. At the top end, they recruited from very clever people, very competitive. It was a remarkable accolade if you were a 22 or 23-year-old to be offered a place in the diplomatic service, you see. And it still is. They still recruit wonderfully well. In contrast to the domestic civil service, um, uh, people in the diplomatic service have, as the Scots would say, a very fine conceit of themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly, if, uh, if they were suffering from any self-doubt, they didn't just show it. <laughs> you mean that they're, 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 they were rather superior? Well, it persons. could be. I mean, I, I, I actually got on with them absolutely fine. But, uh, but uh, one or two uh, predecessors um, have had a difficult time in the Foreign Office. I mean, if you're not up to... Up to snuff, as they would say, um, you'd get spat out. Well, where's the staircase? Just follow around here. Robin Cook met his top officials on the day he was appointed New Labour's first foreign secretary. Well, what they'd like to do, Secretary, is actually just pause here for a second. Yes. Should I have a globe to hold up or something? <laughs> like the budget box. After 18 years in opposition, Cook was determined not to become the creature of silky smooth Foreign Office mandarins. It's not a bad place you've got here. Well, not bad for the son of a chemist teacher. Well, I think I'd take the jacket off and get down to business. This was built to impress foreigners. Um, sometimes, I must confess, particularly in the early days, it quite intimidated me. I said when, after my first fortnight, that I wasn't quite clear whether I had a Rolls-Royce of a support staff which was looking after me exceptionally well, or whether I'd been kidnapped and taken into custody. And the dividing line between these two concepts is actually pretty fine. In the Foreign Office, there was an ethos that foreign policy was somehow separate, not something which politicians should be taking decisions, that there was an area of uh, policy which was sort of over and above politics. Well, that's hogwash. But that's, that was felt by some people. Over the years, a belief has grown up that whichever politician is nominally in charge, Foreign Office mandarins always pursue their own enduring set of policies. But senior diplomats dispute whether the Foreign Office does seek to make ministers its mouthpiece. We don't set out to run the ministers who are put in charge of this department. These people are elected. Uh, to run the government, and it would be absurd. I, I think it would be a, a denial of the profession of public service to try and capture a minister in that way. That's, I, that's the stuff of the music halls, that's the Sir Humphreys, the yes minister stuff. Uh, we don't do that. The Foreign Office regards the arrival of each new minister like an oyster regards that the arrival of a grain of sand. The intrusion of an irritant with a very low statistical probability of ever producing the pearl. For the top mandarins who come to work in the grandest part of the Foreign Office, the celebratory murals are a daily reminder of the time when the British lion strutted the globe. But just over 50 years ago came a prime example of how their sense of effortless superiority was to be tested to destruction. The Suez Crisis of 1956 split the country down the middle. Its chief architect was Sir Anthony Eden, who'd been Foreign Secretary for 12 years before becoming Prime Minister. 
Suez was a cautionary tale of what can happen when a prime minister takes over foreign policy himself to the exclusion of the foreign office. Eden had identified his enemy number one as an Arab strongman. The Egyptian president, Colonel Nasser, was a charismatic nationalist and anti-colonialist. He'd taken back into Egyptian hands the Suez Canal, the jugular vein of the British Empire, from the Anglo-French company that ran it. It was Colonel Nasser, Egypt's dictator, who seized the canal over two months ago. His army has recently been strengthened by the provision of arms and equipment from behind the Iron Curtain. The Foreign Secretary, Selwyn Lloyd, was widely regarded as a creature of the Prime Minister. Eden and Lloyd met with their French opposite numbers to work out how to deal with the Egyptian president. Together, they hatched a plan to snatch back the Suez Canal and to overthrow Colonel Nasser. Their allies in the top secret plot were the Israelis. To work out the final details, Selwyn Lloyd was dispatched on a cloak and dagger mission. He was driven to Sèvres, a Paris suburb, and wearing a disguise, the British Foreign Secretary met his French and Israeli opposite numbers and their military chiefs. He didn't make a good impression on those who knew him because he had a false moustache on. It was ridiculous. And we wanted to laugh as he took it off. <laughs> But the agreement Selwyn Lloyd reached with his co-conspirators was no joke. The plot was to bring down an Arab leader by invading his country. The French record of the top secret meeting shows it was agreed that the Israelis would invade Egypt and Britain and France would then intervene. The plan went ahead. British paratroopers were landed at Port Said. The pretext was that British and French troops were going into Egypt as peacekeepers. In fact, the plan was to seize back the Suez Canal. But the invasion caused the gravest consternation in the Foreign Office amongst its senior officials, almost all of whom had been deliberately kept out of the loop by Eden and Selwyn Lloyd. The Suez Crisis is fascinating because that generation of senior figures in the Foreign Office felt, with a couple of exceptions, one of whom I afraid was the Permanent Secretary, they thought it was madness which is why so many of them were excluded from the inner councils, because Eden wouldn't listen to the Foreign Office's chief legal advisor, because he knew he was going to tell him it was illegal and was unwise. <laughs> and it's a sign of insecurity and a form of mania, too, if you don't listen to the old pros in the Foreign Office. Because Eden was presented within a few days of the nationalisation of the Suez Canal Company by Colonel Nasser with a Joint Intelligence Committee assessment, which was remarkably prescient about what would happen if we tried to go alone, or even with the French without the Americans. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. We believe these actions to have been taken in error, for we do not accept the use of force as a wise or proper instrument for the settlement of international disputes. Eden, who'd lied to the Commons about Suez, felt increasingly under siege. He'd ordered all documents about the plot to be destroyed. And when the White House threatened to pull the plug on the pound sterling, Eden gave up the ghost. Eden resigned on health grounds after pulling our troops out from Suez. So when Lloyd returned to the Foreign Office through an arc of raised eyebrows, but was later to be moved on. Sir. I'm from the BBC. It sounds as though you had a wonderful send-off. Have you any specific reactions now that you leave the Foreign Office after such a long tenure of office? Well, I leave the Foreign Office with great regret. I've been there for seven and a half years out of the last nine years, and I, the Foreign Service is a wonderful service, and no body of men and women could have served a Foreign Secretary with greater loyalty, willingness, or efficiency than the way in which I've been served. I'm very sorry indeed to go. <laughs> Well, may we wish you a very happy birthday, sir. I understand it is your birthday today. Thank you very much. Well, the senior mandarins bidding farewell to Selwyn Lloyd had almost to a man been sidelined over Suez, and their opposition to the whole venture ignored by the foreign secretary and the prime minister. Bye. Bye. 
Mm. So the Foreign Office, though very battered because of Britain's influence in the world, particularly the Middle East, having this terrible setback, and the Anglo-American alliance being put under immense pressure, to put it mildly, felt that they had tried to speak truth unto power. And it was a terrible scar, Suez. And indeed, it affected the conduct of British foreign policy for a generation afterwards. NASA's triumphant survival showed that the age of Palmerston-style gunboat diplomacy was long gone. Well, the meaning of Suez is that there is an end to the methods of the 19th century. The Suez story was a disaster which left a very long shadow. The feeling that we had dropped from being a great power to a very minor power uh, was a tremendous shock to Whitehall and particularly to the Foreign Office. Suez caused a period of agonizing reappraisal for the Foreign Office. Our mighty empire was vanishing as in a dream and Britain had to find new territory to operate in. The Elysee Palace in Paris. Having long stood proudly in splendid isolation from Europe, Britain had applied to join the common market, but the French had kept saying, no. But in 1971, the Prime Minister, Ted Heath, continued the negotiations for entry he'd begun 10 years earlier as a Foreign Office Minister. With the full-hearted support of the Foreign Office, Heath went into two days of tete-a-tete -tete talks with President Pompidou. The press, by this time, were absolutely convinced that nothing was going to happen. The whole thing was a breakdown. And so we went in, and there they all were, and a lot of the British press were looking rather fed up. And we sat in two glorious chairs. And then uh, President Pompidou said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have settled everything. And the whole press absolutely startled. It was wonderful to see them all there. Even our own people, our own civil servants, were shaken by the fact that we had complete success. Government organized fireworks celebrated Britain's entry into Europe. The life of the Foreign Office changed dramatically. Brussels became the most frequent destination for ministers and mandarins. But how would Britain adapt to the rules of the European club? which they joined as Johnny-come-latelys. British foreign secretaries were to discover they had a rather different image in Europe from at home. One of the difficulties of the British foreign secretary, when he gets into his plane to go to Brussels or Paris, he goes in the view of the British media as, a, on the whole, a weak fellow. Feeble, wet, bound to compromise, bound to give way, etc., etc and who is at the top of a department which is tumbling over itself to compromise and sacrifice British interests, he'll be outwitted by those clever foreigners. His plane arrives an hour later in Brussels, and he emerges with quite a different reputation, as somebody much better briefed than anybody else, devious, intelligent, and completely ruthless in the pursuit of British interests. So Foreign Secretary suffers both from the image of the Foreign Office at home and from the image of Britain abroad, which are completely opposite. Each month, foreign ministers from the 27 EU countries meet to try to agree common policies. The meetings are fueled by regular infusions of caffeine, and the ministers often seem to feel that an agreement is only worthwhile if it's reached in the small hours. The meetings offer Foreign Office diplomats the chance to deploy their deal-making skills and then to compose a communique for the media on what the Council of Ministers had actually agreed. The, the communiques, of course, were the, the, they drove you really up the pole because uh, there's nothing that bureaucrats like better uh, than drafting. And when you get, uh, as we were then, 12 uh, members of the community drafting a communique. Every comma, every apostrophe uh, was uh, queried. The translation between English and French, the, uh, the nuances, it went on and on and on and on. We still use the verb agree, would we? I would like Side. to use the word agree rather than decide. I hope we have to, have to well, they well, They might decide. prefer agree. I mean, they agree is they... better, it's a treaty word. They say they won't decide. Mm, well, I don't think we ought to accept 
that decision is definitely dead. No, I don't. And eight people said this morning that they would prefer... Exactly. ...declaration to decision. Um, but I'm not certain that that was bottom line for... No. For all their skills at finding just the right form of words, Foreign Office mandarins have over the years been attacked as a gentleman's club, a self-perpetuating elite drawn from far too narrow a social base. New Labour's first Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, wanted to challenge what he saw as the cosy club. He decided to use the Foreign Office's historic chambers as recruiting offices to transform its traditionally stuffy image into one more representative of modern Britain. I mean, one of the reasons why we end up with recruits who are mostly from public schools in Oxford Bridge is because other people aren't applying. Wow! <laughs> I don't think I've seen this room before. Potential recruits were invited into Cook's inner sanctum. So, Mr Robin, do you like the new office? Do I like my office? I'm trying to change the painting, but we've never... You know, that, that fellow over there, I felt, is, is not the modern image I would like. <laughs> uh, my problem is finding something to replace it, because you need something that big, that shape. And the trouble is, all the paintings that are that big are all backward-looking and logically unsound, but we're working at it. Cook had the painting removed and replaced for a time with an antique mirror but he too was to be unceremoniously removed by the Prime Minister. Some years later, Tony Blair shook up the traditionally male Foreign Office by appointing Margaret Beckett as the first ever female Foreign Secretary, to her astonishment. And what did you say when he gave you the job as Foreign Secretary? Uh, nothing repeatable on a family show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard uh, you used the F word. You were quite surprised. And I heard from Jack Straw that's exactly what he said when he was asked to be Foreign Secretary. <laughs> so it's a track record. I, I can't quite remember, is the answer. I mean, I, I, I may have said, you know, oh, dot, dot, dot. The F word? No, I don't think it was. I think it was, it was uh, the, uh, the C word. No, not, 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 <laughs> see, so, I said, oh, Christ, I said, oh, oh, oh Christ, <laughs> something like that. The question was, what is the point of the FCO now? The answer is, there has never been a more important time for foreign policy, never been a greater need for a dedicated foreign service of the highest quality. We're lucky in ours. Let's keep it that way. But among her dedicated, high-quality officials, there were some who were less than elated by their female boss. Obviously, for them, it was um, new territory, and, and, you know, they'd had Jack for so long and they were used to Jack. <laughs> the people around me were very supportive. Um, equally, though, I got the impression that across the Foreign Office, there were those who thought it was, there was something profoundly wrong about having a woman as foreign secretary, which I have to say I found a bit difficult to believe in this day and age, but there you go. From within the Foreign Office, some officials used the cloak of anonymity to brief the press against Margaret Beckett. I thought it was a bit contemptible, uh, but I thought they'd have to get used to it. Get used to you? Mm. Because there was a quote in, in one of the pieces I read, which uh, allegedly came from a Foreign Office official, that you were inaudible, invisible and incompetent as Foreign Secretary. Mm, I thought that was a very clever phrase from a very stupid man. <laughs> Do you know who it was? No idea. <laughs> don't care. <laughs> uh, I don't think highly enough of him, whoever he is, to want to know who he is. David Miliband took the place of Margaret Beckett when Gordon Brown became Prime Minister. Brown wanted his youthful political rival to bring a modern management style to the old Palace of Dreams. We are a permanent member of the Security Council. We're a leading member of the European Union. We've got to be a country that behaves in a serious way. And we, uh, I think, have to take seriously that responsibility. And I suppose the building brings that out. There's a danger of faded glory. And we work very hard to make sure we don't fall into that trap. The, tra the faded glory comes, I think, in two forms. One, that you're not a serious player. Or secondly, that you try to behave in the way your predecessors did 50 or 100 years ago. And if I behaved like that, 
I wouldn't be taken seriously either. The thoroughly modern Miller Band produced this booklet, which was distributed to all our diplomatic posts abroad. It included peel-off stickers to encourage good work by staff. And Miliband became the first foreign secretary with his own video blog on the web. Go. Hello and welcome to the FCO's new blog pages. These blog pages where ministers and officials at the Foreign Office, ambassadors, but also young entrants into the Foreign Service will be talking about the priorities, the ideas, the values that underpin British foreign policy are intended to open up what too often has been a secret garden of diplomacy. The most exotic plant in the secret garden of diplomacy is MI6, the secret intelligence service. MI6 comes under the authority of the Foreign Secretary and sends our spies around the world, often under diplomatic cover. Until recently, the Foreign Office wasn't prepared publicly even to acknowledge the existence of its secret intelligence service. Too great an openness about a secret service lands you into an awful lot of trouble. And as we've tried to be more and more open about MI6, so we land ourselves in more and more trouble. My day was simple, it didn't exist. Of course, everybody <laughs> knew it existed. It was absurd, but it's quite often those absurdities are quite helpful. And how did you refer to, to MI6 in, in the Foreign Office? Well, formally and publicly, I never referred to it. No, but in, within the Foreign Office? I'm sure they're secret. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, the, the phrase is, the friends, what do our friends say? I, my lips are sealed. Some things you take to the grave with you. The panoply of protection that goes with intelligence has an insidious power. Because this has been secretly obtained, and you mustn't leave this paper lying around. There's a man standing beside you with a lockbox who's going to take it away as soon as you've read it. You attach slightly more importance to it, probably, than if you'd read exactly the same thing in the newspaper that morning. And sometimes it seemed to me that you could have read exactly the same thing in the newspaper that morning. But it's exciting and it's, it has this extra dimension of secrecy. So I think sometimes Ministers, particularly, attach more importance to uh, uh, intelligence that has come covertly than they should. The intelligence failures very often come not because you can't see what's happening, but because you misinterpret the intentions. And you misinterpret the intentions. It's known as the Wiccanist fallacy. You, 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 you read their intentions as if they'd been educated at Winchester. You know, and they haven't been educated at Winchester. They're a bunch of thugs, and actually their intentions aren't our, in, our sort of intentions. And they may not be bluffing. They may be actually out to do something catastrophically dangerous. The Foreign Office is also responsible for GCHQ, which runs a worldwide eavesdropping network to intercept the communications of Britain's enemies. But while it's natural to seek to find out what one's enemies are up to, what about our friends in Europe? It's been reported that successive British Prime Ministers and Foreign Secretaries have had the advantage of secret intelligence reports on our European partners when negotiating with them in the EU. Did MI6 provide you with intelligence on our European allies and what they were doing? Well, I don't believe you should spy on your European allies. I'm quite clear about that. Europe is a different relationship to most uh, other ones, and I think you don't spy on your friends. Well, I must say, I used to go to Paris, I used to discuss all sorts of things with my French colleagues. I can't believe that they would ever spy on me under any circumstances. I simply can't. They wouldn't do that, would they? <laughs> but would you yeah. spy on them? <laughs> That's a separate question. You'll have to ask, you know, whoever. Does MI6, SIS, um, spy on our, our partners in Europe? One never comments on intelligence matters. Does MI6 spy on our own uh, European allies? I'm never going to go into detail about what we do or we don't do, and uh, nobody ever does that. Uh, but I'm just telling you that what MI6 does, as MI5 does and GCHQ does, is ensure that it works in the national interest and that it's, all its operations are lawful and ethical. 
that's a very sensitive thing, and I can't talk much about it uh, uh, even now. Um, but um, how shall I put it? I wasn't left in ignorance. You weren't left in ignorance uh, because MI6 was spying on our. Well, I had, a, I had a whole, I had a whole, uh, you know, a whole flow of information coming out all the time, uh, which they could, which they could supplement. But I really don't want to say more than that. Why not? Because uh, there are ways and means of doing things which uh, continue, no doubt, I, though I've no knowledge of that, and anyway, which I'm not really supposed to, not really, don't want to talk about. The absolutely key relationship for the Foreign Office is with the Prime Minister of the day. The Foreign Office looms physically over 10 Downing Street, but Prime Ministers often want to be their own Foreign Secretaries and cut a dash on the world stage. This has led to a number of battles royal, with Number 10 often accusing the Foreign Office of being temperamentally inclined to kowtow to foreigners. The toughest negotiations any Foreign Secretary has are always with his own Prime Minister. For the Foreign Secretary to be effective, he has to have the backing of the Prime Minister and his Cabinet colleagues, otherwise he's ineffective. And the worst thing any Foreign Secretary can do, really, is say to his other colleagues, well, of course, I agree with you, but she, meaning Mrs Thatcher, won't, or alternatively, some other Prime Minister won't. I mean, that's the worst thing you can do. When Margaret Thatcher came to office, in her early days, like most Prime Ministers, she said she would concentrate her energies on the home front. The Foreign Office had no idea what was about to hit them. Margaret Thatcher had not the slightest experience at the Foreign Office uh, when she went to number 10, and didn't regret it. Mrs Thatcher's view of the Foreign Office was never a very generous one. I think it's one of the curious shortcomings about her, her qualifications for the job, actually, that unlike most prime ministers, she'd never held any of the great offices of state. Uh, she would love to have been chancellor. So she had a, a love-hate relationship with the treasury. She, she knew it and, and wanted it, but never had it. She never had that sort of love-hate relationship with the foreign office. She was always wary of it. Oh, she didn't like the foreign office at all. Uh, famously, she said, we have a Department of Agriculture to look after farmers, we have a Department of Defence to look after the soldiers, and we've got the Foreign Office to look after the foreigners. Mrs Thatcher quickly began to relish her role on the world stage and liked to quote the line that when it came to standing up for British interests, the Foreign Office was just a hotbed of cold feet. The Foreign Office thought I didn't have much skill at diplomacy. Certainly diplomacy wasn't my forte. It was a policy that was right for Britain, which was my forte. And certainly, I spoke with a directness, a truth, and a strength uh, to which they were not used. And they might even, some of them, have been shocked. After all, their whole culture was not sense of purpose, sense of direction. It was compromise. It was negotiation. It was diplomacy. Compromise was a dirty word in Mrs. Thatcher's political lexicon. Uh, she felt that we, because we spent so long studying foreigners and learning their languages and living in their countries, that uh, from time to time we forgot who paid us and where our interests were. She used to hate that expression, let's find a, let's find a form of words, Prime Minister. That sort of implied to her Write it, papering over differences and uh, distinctions and uh, trying to obscure concessions. No, she wanted it black and white and she liked to confront people and issues very directly. The Argentine invasion of the Falklands, ordered by General Galtieri's military junta, played to Mrs Thatcher's black and white world view. The Falklands had long been British territory, which the Argentines passionately believed belonged to them. But the Junta's military occupation of the islands came as a complete surprise to the Foreign Office. It was a failure of our diplomatic and intelligence services. The Foreign Office was accused of having signalled to the Junta that Britain no longer cared about the Falklands. Lord Carrington, who was Mrs Thatcher's Foreign Secretary, felt compelled to resign. I mean, this was an appalling humiliation for the British. And there was a deep sense of outrage in the country. I felt that somebody had better take the blame for what had happened. 
uh, and we ought to clear the deck so that we didn't have a sort of internal dispute about who was responsible for everything. So it uh, cleared the air. I think I'm absolutely right to resign. And I've just taken over from Lord Carrington, who was a very fine foreign secretary, a very fine foreign secretary indeed. And of course, my first concern is the affair of the Falkland Islands. And uh, I'm going to start, I've already started on work, uh, work on that this evening. Francis Pym, an old Etonian like Lord Carrington, was a political rival who Mrs. Thatcher had felt forced to appoint to try to steady the ship. But she was almost immediately at odds with him. Knowing her political survival was at stake, Mrs. Thatcher was convinced that force was the only language the junta would understand. But she was dismayed when Francis Pym and his top foreign office officials warned her strongly about the grave dangers of military action. I do think it's spineless when you put all the difficulties. Um, they wanted us to negotiate. You can't negotiate away an invasion. You can't negotiate away that the freedom of your people has been taken, taken by a cruel dictator. You've got to stand up and you've got to have the spine to do it. Mrs. Thatcher dispatched a naval task force to sail the 8,000 miles to the South Atlantic. It was part of a twin-track approach, the prospect of war, coupled with diplomatic efforts to prevent it, led by her foreign secretary. For all his somewhat fey manner, Francis Pym had won a military cross during the Second World War, though some saw his diplomatic efforts as little more than appeasement. I thought it was my duty as foreign secretary to go to the ultimate limits in trying to find a way of not having to go to war. Well, I had three years uh, of war in, in a tank in the desert and, and in Italy, many, many battles uh, I was invo involved in. And anybody who'd been through that experience would want to avoid it if they possibly could. I'm not in the business of appeasement. Appeasement is wrong. It only encourages dictators. Dictators have to be beaten. Appeasement is no part of my psyche. Mrs. Thatcher thought the Foreign Office were a bunch of appeasers in the Falklands, always wanting to negotiate away sovereignty and all the rest of it. And there's two ways of looking at that. One of the, the great reasons for having a top-flight diplomatic service and a really good Foreign Office is that you avoid war. One of the prime requirements of any country, let alone an open society like ours, is to avoid war. And if you avoid war, you save blood and you save treasure and you pay for yourself many times over by just preventing one conflict. And so their entire bias is to solve international disputes through talk and reason rather than war, except as a very last resort. And that can be seen, if you're a prime minister who thinks in terms of primary colours, as appeasement. But it isn't necessarily. And in retirement, she said some terrible things about them, about my job is to buy a backbone and put it into the Foreign Office, or words like that. Mrs. Thatcher unleashed the task force after diplomacy had failed. Our ships were bombed as we prepared to land. The battle for the Falklands would turn out to be a damned close-run thing. But in the end, we won a famous victory. Mrs. Thatcher took the salute at the victory parade, and she remarked privately, in the Falklands, I thought I was fighting two enemies at the same time, the Argies and the Foreign Office. Margaret Thatcher felt she'd taught the diplomatic service a lesson in what could be achieved by standing up for Britain. And she now decided that if the depictions of Britain's glorious past in the Foreign Office could be seen more clearly, it might inject some backbone into its diplomats. She sanctioned extensive restoration works. When the elaborate work on the Foreign Office had been finished, I was Foreign Secretary and we gave a party in the Locarno Room, which is full of splendid gold. And uh, I stood at the top of the stairs and I was slightly alarmed when I saw the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, approaching. Of course, she'd been asked because I never quite knew, because she, of these mixed feelings she had about the Foreign Office, she might well say, she's perfectly capable of saying, what a terrible waste of money. This money could have been much better spent elsewhere. Um, but she was beaming, and she said, 
she always spoke to me as if I was going to disagree with what she said. She said, you see, Douglas, you know, you've got to remember, you've got to keep these places in really good state. It's terribly important. And she swept on very happy, and I was happy too. Officials were determined to keep the newly refurbished Foreign Office up to snuff. Tons of accumulated pigeon droppings had been cleared from the office roofs. They brought in an avian predator. She's a, uh, a North American Harris hawk. Lives in sort of Arizona, around that sort of area. This is, uh, this is Jess, she's a four-year-old one. And we just use her for the, like, the pigeon control. The hawk's instincts seem to mirror Margaret Thatcher's own style of diplomacy. My job's to come sort of every other day to make the pigeons think that she's a resident hawk. Sometimes her own foreign secretary would be in the Iron Lady's sights. Tensions between prime minister and foreign minister are not unknown. They're almost bound to develop with the passage of time as prime ministers become more confident of their own view and more experienced in the world they're trying to deal with. And it becomes all the more important for prime minister and foreign minister to retain a close working relationship, to hammer out such differences in advance rather than in public or in mid-flight. We've achieved that because we've been able during the two terms in office to move Britain from the sidelines to the centre of the European community. And Mrs Thatcher's relationship with her foreign secretary grew steadily worse over the years. I think they were a rather effective duo in a way, provided neither tried to play the other's role. Trouble is, of course, both of them often wanted to play the other's role as well. I used to sit there in their, in their bilateral meetings, which the Foreign Secretary and Prime Minister had once a week if they were both in London. I used to feel I was almost like a marriage counsellor, seeing this relationship breaking down and being helpless to do much about it. Charles Pole had been a high-flying young diplomat when he was sent to number 10 on a short secondment as Mrs Thatcher's foreign affairs advisor. But he quickly became indispensable to her, particularly over Europe, where she was much more Eurosceptic than the Foreign Office. And there was a major battle over a speech that Mrs Thatcher was to make in Belgium. The College of Europe in Bruges had long been pestering for Margaret Thatcher to give a speech there. And they said that every other head of government in Europe had done it and she should do it. And the Foreign Office recommended it. And I used to say to them, look, I wouldn't. You know, I don't know what will come out of this if you give her this opportunity. You may not be too happy with the outcome. No, no, we've got to do it. You know, we, only Britain has not given this speech. She really has to do it. So, all right, we ended up, we were going to do it. From his office in number 10, Charles Pohl worked on a first draft of Mrs Thatcher's Bruges speech and with her approval, sent it over to the Foreign Office for comment. What was the reaction when the first draft of the speech was, was sent to the Foreign Office? Horror. Yes. I would resist horror, and the Foreign Office is never horrified. The Foreign Office reacted with reasoned arguments. <laughs> horror, what, well, what, horror what, because what, she was taking such a forceful view about how power should be exercised in Europe. But, Part of it was weariness, oh God, here she goes again. Uh, all our careful work in keeping things on an even keel, a favourite Foreign Office expression with our European partners, is going to be put at risk because she's determined to uh, stir things up and put a different point of view. Partly, oh God, we don't say things this way. This is not our style of explaining Britain's European policy. Well, I remember thinking it wouldn't do. I thought the tone was unnecessarily critical and uh, self-defeating. Foreign Office attempts to delete what they saw as inflammatory passages and substitute more emollient language were rejected by number 10. My anxiety was that certain passages which um, had been, I thought, too abrasive, too rough and striking the wrong note, which we thought we had changed, had, had reappeared, if anything, in, in a stronger form. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain only to see them reimposed at a European level, with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. Geoffrey Howe's view of the speech and, and uh, the attitudes towards Europe, he thought it revealed. He said, I felt it was a little bit like being married to a clergyman who suddenly proclaimed his disbelief in God. 
I think it probably took him five years to think of that phrase. She said of you that he fell into the habit that the Foreign Office seems to cultivate of subordinating national interests to negotiating tactics. In the end, his vision became finding a form of words. Yes, a grotesque parody and a, a remarkable insight into her own lack of insight. <laughs> a grotesque. She, she talked about your insatiable appetite for compromise um, and that would sometimes lead her to lash out at you uh, in front of others. Yes, well, that's certainly right. But one could hardly accuse Margaret Thatcher of having an insatiable appetite for compromise. It needed someone around to moderate that lack of effort had to compromise. Charles Pohl's power at number 10 had grown so much that he was increasingly referred to as the real foreign secretary, and senior mandarins felt that one of their own had gone over to the enemy. This made life difficult for Pohl's younger brother, Jonathan, who pronounced his name Powell, and was a fast-rising young diplomat in the Foreign Office. Well, I had a unique view of number 10 when I was in the Foreign Office, because my brother Charles was Mrs. Thatcher's foreign policy advisor and had been there for many years. So I was seen with some suspicion in the Foreign Office as somehow related to Charles and therefore responsible for him. And I remember going to the Permanent Secretary's morning meetings and having people sniggering about Charles and some terrible thing that Charles had done to the Foreign Office yet again, and then all looking at me as if I was somehow responsible. So I did have this, uh, this, um, this feeling. And I remember Douglas Hurd interviewed me for the job of uh, one of the Assistant Private Secretaries at one stage. And he looked at me at the end of it and said, but I really, I'm not sure I can do that. There'll be a Powell Pole problem, because my brother calls himself Charles Pole. So we, uh, I, I was always sort of, I felt, put in a bit of a disadvantage in the Foreign Office because um, Charles was there uh, running foreign policy from number 10. I'd poisoned the trail for him, had I? Well, I mean, it seems to me he, he was lucky to have been turned down, but he clearly got a better job as a result of it, so <laughs> I don't think he need feel too badly about that. Ironically, Jonathan Powell was recruited by another destiny prime minister and was the Powell behind the throne throughout Tony Blair's years in number 10. Like most prime ministers, when Tony Blair came to office, as when Thatcher came to office, they were basically interested in domestic policy rather than foreign policy. So when they get into the job and they realise what they've got to do in terms of foreign policy, how much of the responsibility lies on them, that's when they get fascinated by it. And were you aware of how the Foreign Office saw Tony Blair in terms of what was said to be a marginalising of the Foreign Office because he would take over foreign policy himself? Well, yes, of course. I came from the Foreign Office, so I knew precisely what they thought when my brother was there, and they felt that uh, Thatcher had been marginalising the Foreign Office on foreign policy. And then I knew what they thought when we were there, and they thought the, the same thing. There's always a sense in the Foreign Office that number 10 is trying to trump them, trying to run foreign policy, and it should really be left to them. But for the Prime Minister, it is somehow easier to make things happen in foreign policy. You can, by saying something or doing something, change things in a way that takes a much longer time in domestic policy. If you're changing health or education, there's a long, hard grind to make things change. Foreign policy, by attending a conference, agreeing a EU budget, whatever it is, you can make a bold stroke much more easily. But it was on the question of the use of military force that Blair made his boldest strokes and battled with the Foreign Office. Tony Blair went along with the US view that Saddam Hussein was the West's enemy number one in the Middle East. Saddam was accused of having weapons of mass destruction that were an immediate threat to Britain. Secret plans were drawn up by Britain and America to overthrow Saddam by force. Two months before the invasion of Iraq, Tony Blair arrived to address a unique meeting in London. All 150 senior British ambassadors from across the world had been summoned to attend the meeting, and Tony Blair began with a tongue-in-cheek compliment to them. Thank you very much indeed, and it's my great pleasure to come along this afternoon and to begin by saying a word of thanks as, as Prime Minister for all the, the help that the, the Foreign Office um, give Prime Ministers over the years. The wonderful advice, um, the unstinting spirit of cooperation and, and, and help, which has uh, seen me through many difficult situations. I was actually trying Among the ambassadors at the meeting was the distinguished career diplomat Sir Ivor Roberts. It was extraordinary to be at this meeting of ambassadors, the first time that such a, a meeting had been convened of every ambassador and high commissioner in the globe brought back to the Foreign Office for a 
a meeting addressed by the Prime Minister, addressed by the Foreign Secretary, and there was this enormous elephant in the room that wasn't um, addressed, which was the Iraq War. Absolutely extraordinary, one of the most fundamental foreign policy decisions, certainly in my professional career, and on a par with Suez, wasn't open for discussion. And meanwhile, we spent an inordinate amount of time on management process and management speak. But the phrases um, that were regularly trotted out of synergies, value for money, silo building, empowerment, pushback, these are all candidates for a game of bullshit bingo. Uh, and they're not worth worthy terms, I think, for use in modern diplomacy. Sir Ivor Roberts said that there was this great meeting of ambassadors before the war in Iraq was declared and it was all Wall Street management speak and all the ambassadors were there and none of them were asked their view about the forthcoming war in Iraq. No, no, I'm not really in a position to comment on it but I do actually think it's a good thing if the Foreign Office thinks a bit more about management in the way that other departments have. It's been quite antediluvian in the past. Inside the Foreign Office, there were real questions about whether Number 10 was keeping the Foreign Secretary Jack Straw and his officials in the loop over Iraq. How much had Tony Blair involved the Foreign Office in the policy and Jack Straw in the run-up to war? I think the Foreign Office felt, and I'm pretty sure they were right, that even if they were as explicit as they could be in their anxieties about the run-up to the war and the legal position, that Tony Blair was going to do it anyway. They had become really quite considerably marginalised compared to the great Department of State they'd once been. They hadn't got the self-confidence that they once had. And I think the run-up to the Iraq war was another blow to them. I suppose what some of the Foreign Office feel is that they were kind of cut out of the loop and big decisions would be taken despite what the Foreign Office felt or thought about it. Well, of course. I mean, you have a discussion about foreign policy. They weren't cut out, they weren't cut out of the loop. They were always informed meticulously by letters which had made their way into newspapers all too often in the past. But there were, there were letters that were written from Number 10 that would inform them exactly of the discussions and of the decisions. But they weren't the ones who got to make the decisions in the end. The decisions would be made by the Prime Minister on the basis of the advice from the Foreign Office and elsewhere. It doesn't necessarily going to do what they want. They may be wrong about what they propose. A million people took to the streets to try to prevent war in Iraq. Their route was to take them past the Foreign Office and Number 10. Only one senior Foreign Office Mandarin had resigned over Iraq, and Jack Straw publicly supported Tony Blair's position on the war. I like Jack Straw, I've known him for over 30 years, and I don't know, but I have a suspicion that one day he will come out after time has elapsed and say he didn't really believe in that war certainly without a specific UN authorization, which we didn't get. He strove mightily to get it till the very last minute. So I'm sorry to disappoint uh, Peter Hennessy, uh, but I, you know, I'm comfortable about the decisions I took, and I was responsible for them, and I could have, I could have stopped the war. I've always been conscious of that. You could if have I, stopped the war? How? I, I could have stopped Britain's involvement, because if I'd gone to the House of Commons, I said, I, I don't think we should go to war. Uh, without being conceited, there's no way they would have voted for it. If I'd left the government, that would have been it. Did you ever, were you ever tempted to do that? Not a, no, I mean, the, what, it doesn't quite work that way, because what, what happened was that on, in the weeks, what I was anxious to try and do in the weeks leading up to March was to ensure that the United Kingdom could go down a different path. And so was Tony, although I think that he was more... Uh, always more ready to embrace the idea of military action. For the second time in 50 years, the Foreign Office, whose prime duty is to use diplomacy to prevent war, had been sidelined by Number 10 over a British invasion in the Middle East. A Prime Minister had used what many people saw as a concocted case for going to war, and our diplomats, who'd long prided themselves on their expertise in Arab affairs, had once again been powerless to prevent war.
there was nobody left who had personal memories as an official of Suez. But I think for that generation in the Foreign Office, 2003 was comparable to 1956 for two generations before. It was the great blot in their career life as officials, and it was something which they will never forget and will affect them profoundly to the end of their days in Crown service. I really do think it was comparable to Suez for their generation. Lord Palmerston's palace was built to protect and promote Britain's interests across the globe. But in recent years, the Foreign Office has suffered both from the number 10 takeover of foreign policy and from Treasury spending cuts, raising the question whether this great office of state is now more show than substance. The whole weight of the Foreign Office has become less. Uh, I think that uh, Tony Blair assisted in that process. Uh, I think we're, we're uh, diminishing our, rep our overall representation. I think that some particular closures of posts are, 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 are unwise. And I have a feeling, as I've said in debate, that the Foreign Office itself, the, the process of advice in London, has become somewhat hollowed out. You don't have quite those reserves of experience and wisdom uh, available to the Foreign Secretary, uh, which there used to be. Do you accept this idea that the Foreign Office has been hollowed out? No, I think mean, that's nonsense. I think the Foreign Office is uh, every bit as capable as it was, um, every bit uh, as well manned as it was. I think that the nature of foreign policy has changed and is changing and will carry on changing and that you will get more done between uh, leaders themselves uh, and that will mean that there is less for ambassadors to do. As communications change, as I say, old-fashioned telegrams or before that letters were the key way of communicating and often would take weeks and months to come back to, to England. Now it's all just as the 24-hour news, you have 24-hour diplomacy. Well, the people who alerted me first, oddly enough, to the decline in the relative position of the Foreign Office in the constellation of departments were my friends in the Secret Intelligence Service. MI6? Yep. And they first alerted me by telling me how they were really quite upset at the number of research analysts being cut back. Because the first people the SIS would try their special stuff on were the research analysts of the Foreign Office to see what was new and what wasn't. And they felt rather bereft because they were being thinned out because of budget cuts. But one of them put it really rather wonderfully, veteran of the Cold War. He said to me, the two pillars that sustained my service, the secret intelligence service, for the bulk of my time, have both gone, the Soviet Union and the Foreign Office. And that's when I realized how serious it was getting. The Foreign Office never publicly expresses doubts about its superior status. Yet in recent times, it's often seemed to resemble less a great office of state and more a palace of dreams. Next time, the Treasury, the oldest of the three great offices. It's the Ministry of Tax and Tears. In Whitehall, knowledge is power, and the Treasury likes to think it knows most of all. Treasury was a brilliant department. It was the best department I ever served in. It's like an Oxbridge college, you know, some brilliant minds engaged in open debate and completely detached from the real world. And the Corridors of Power season continues next week here on BBC Four with Getting Our Way with Sir Christopher Mayer. That's on Monday at nine. Next tonight, stay with us for a slightly more irreverent take on the week's news with Charlie Brooker. <laughs>